Good morning. It's Exodus today. We have just the first three chapters. And uh, it's been a long road through Genesis. And now uh, looking at where we wound up, we had 70 people uh, from Jacob's family that would wind up in Egypt. This is a number of perfection. And yet you have a foreshadow um, of what's to come when it mentions the feelings of Egyptians towards uh, shepherds. Um, and then you see the uh, concept of slavery established um, in the midst of, of the famine. Then in Exodus 1, you see now this number 70 uh, referenced again. And then uh, the time comes when uh, the memory of Joseph is now forgotten. And so this new king puts in very, very strict practices that embraces the um, discomfort of the people against um, these new uh, Hebrews that are in their land. And now you have um, this, this dark, dark period, not only of slavery, but also of uh, laws against the Hebrew babies, um, keeping them from growing up to be even uh, more of a powerful nation. Uh, and so Moses is now born into this uh, midst of, of chaos and, and, and babies' lives being snatched away. Uh, you have his mother place him in literally what is called an ark and basically sent off um, and in a sense of salvation of uh, Pharaoh's daughter actually um, sees the baby floating down the river. Uh, her heart's captured uh, by obviously the um, precious nature of a three-month-old. And then amazingly enough, even though uh, Moses' mother gets to raise him, he would then be brought up in the palace um, after he was, was weaned. Um, and so he still knew who he was in a sense of his identity, um, but he was spared um, the, the tragedy of, of so many um, other babies that were his age that did not make it. Um, later on, uh, as an adult, he would actually slay an Egyptian who was attacking a Hebrew, winds up fleeing to Midian because Midian, he's afraid of his own life, um, meets the priest there, Raul, um, winds up marrying one of his daughters, becoming the uh, shepherd of his flocks, um, starts this new life. And all of a sudden, in chapter 3, you have a shift take place where Moses is out with the flocks. And all of a sudden, he sees this burning bush, um, which for the, the nature of the climate uh, would not have been that unusual. But um, the difference was this bush was burning and not consumed. So it just continued to burn. And as Moses um, comes closer, the Lord, the angel of the Lord specifically speaks from the bush. Um, tells him that he's on holy ground, he's to take off his shoes. Um, he comes closer and, um, and, and does this obediently. And as he uh, is spoken to, he is called to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage. He asks, who am I to say that has sent me? Uh, and famously, the Lord tells him, I am that I am has sent you. Um, and so this, this challenge is, is brought forth of Moses to go forward um, the Lord says that he will not um, be met with favor from Pharaoh. He knows that Pharaoh will not relent. Um, and yet in the end, um, not only will they leave, they won't leave empty-handed. So you see all this in Exodus chapter 3. Um, again, a pivotal chapter in the calling of Moses uh, to um, set forth all that will happen in the chapters ahead. Genesis 4 through 6 today, um, you'll see uh, several interesting passages. And then Aaron is also a, a major theme. Um, right on top in Genesis 4, you have God uh, dealing with Moses, uh, showing several signs um, that will later be presented to Egypt. Um, his staff becoming a serpent, um, Moses' hand becoming leprous, and also um, the water becoming uh, blood. And even with all these signs, Moses is um, skeptical um, about how this is all going to work. He says, I'm slow of speech. Um, God actually brings up his older brother Aaron. And uh, after agreeing to do this, Moses um, says, okay, you know, if my brother's going to speak on my behalf, um, we'll go forward. And he packs up his family. Um, you have a very interesting um, passage regarding um, God and his anger um, and the circumcision of, of Moses' oldest son. Um, uh, on the road, uh, God approaches them, and Zipporah winds up circumcising the son, and then calls uh, Moses the uh, husband of blood. You're not given much detail at all about uh, how or why exactly what this is doing, 
Um, but we know with God's covenant, um, the circumcision is the mark of, of God's hand and promise. And now that Moses is in this new role, um, best we can uh, imagine is that um, God wants uh, this to be carry through, um, whatever the reason that it hadn't been done to this point, um, it, it has been taken care of at this point. Um, and as they go on, um, he meets up with Aaron. Uh, they'll go into Egypt together. Pharaoh does not uh, hear anything kindly, um, even though it's only just a feast. They're asking for a three-day journey into the wilderness to honor um, God um, and to, to worship with the feast. Uh, Pharaoh's response is that all the labor that they typically have to do is now the same except no straw for the bricks. Uh, and the people are very upset about this. Um, there's much complaining, um, much frustration with Moses. Um, Moses goes back to God. God actually reassures, reassures the covenant with him, brings up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and tells them that they never knew his name as he's referring to him now. We know that I am that I am. You also see God's holy, holy name in the sense of what we would refer to as Yahweh. Um, it sometimes is mentioned as the Tetragrammaton. It was uh, four letters that um, comes from the, the Hebrew word or root of to be. Um, so some similar connotation to I am, but I remember uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been referring to um, God as um, God Almighty, um, Shaddai. There was no specific name that he had um, given them past this. And so um, God in this kind of uh, movement now is bringing himself even closer to his covenant people, um, revealing himself more personally, um, and which is amazing because he had already met with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in many personal fashion of uh, different accounts. But uh, now you have this kind of new level that they're hitting. And uh, towards the end of chapter 6, the um, genealogy is given from uh, the sons of Levi, and it's interesting here that um, Moses is not going into in detail. You have Aaron as the one that is mentioned with uh, the sons and given specific focus here. Um, this will make sense as we go way forward, whereas you see Aaron, the one that kind of becomes this priest, the depiction of, of the first priest, the depiction of um, this priestly lineage. Um, Moses has a very specific role, um, but as the, as the firstborn, Aaron actually does carry um, forth this um, role in the sense of headship um, for that line. Um, and so Moses has, has a specific uh, role um, that he's fulfilling, that he's equipped for, um, even though he may not feel he's able to speak to it. Um, Aaron's with him, and, and together um, they'll lead forth um, what God is wanting to execute. In Exodus 7 through 9, you have a uh, lot of pace that picks up. Uh, Exodus 7, you have the first true challenge uh, between Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh. Um, the staff becoming a serpent is displayed, um, showing God's power. And, of course, Pharaoh seeks out all his um, best magicians, and, and they're able to duplicate um, this miracle. But um, Moses' staff winds up eating and consuming all the other um, staffs that have become snakes. Um, and so Moses picks it back up and um, it does say Pharaoh's uh, heart would be hardened and that is true and, and you'll see that time and time again. Um, Moses' uh, progression there um, becomes into the, the plagues. Uh, you see God um, giving him instruction at the end of the chapter to turn all the water um, of Egypt into wine. It's interesting because even the water that are in the pots um, become wine. So him striking the Nile affects all the water um, throughout Egypt, and, and Pharaoh and them are um, forced to even attempt to dig new wells and um, seek some way to, to um, recover from this. And you have seven days pass before this is removed, and then in chapter 8, you have three different plagues, um, all involving animals, uh, the uh, frogs, the gnats, and the swarms of flies, and um, all throughout, the magicians can duplicate um, these uh, plagues as well, but they cannot remove um, the animals or the swarms that have been caused by the first plague. So really um, no relief um, by anything that can be done uh, through Pharaoh's hand, or at least these magicians. And then chapter 9, you have three more plagues. Um, these are kind of more uh, related to afflictions. You have diseases on livestock, um, abscesses or like kind of sores on people. Um, and then finally hail that 
um, just falls and, and, and strikes the, uh, the animals that would be in the field or, or the, the harvest, the, um, any kind of the produce that would be um, had. And so, again, seven plagues that go forth in these three chapters. Um, Hera, uh, Pharaoh rather has plenty of times where he tells Moses and Aaron that you know he's done, it's over, and as soon as the plague is, is up, he, um, he's back to having a hardened heart. So you see this repeat itself even in chapter 10 uh, with two more plagues. Uh, this time the locusts and also plague of darkness. Um, you see that all the good that was done in the time of Joseph and the plenty uh, has now been eaten away um, with the entire land covered in locusts and then in darkness where um, no one goes outside because you can't even see uh, one another um, except for, of course, in the land of Goshen, which is where all the um, Hebrews are at. And uh, at the end of chapter uh, 10, you see kind of a climax of uh, Moses saying, you know, um, getting very frustrated. Pharaoh saying, you know, I, I, this next time I'm just going to kill you and Aaron when you come. Um, God responds with this 10th plague, uh, which is the final plague. And uh, chapter 11, this is detailed um, as the plague of the firstborn. And uh, chapter 12 um, gives the specific response and all that will follow. Um, the biggest note here is that the Passover meal, um, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, all this will follow and, and be a commemoration of this moment. Um, and as the, the death angel um, would sweep through the land, um, all the Egyptian firstborn from Pharaoh all the way down to the lowest servant were impacted uh, losing their firstborn son, and yet the children of Israel, following the careful instructions that um, Moses gave them from the Lord, um, they would be passed over uh, because of the blood. Uh, the lamb that was um, killed and, and eaten for each home, um, not a bone broken, and yet the blood um, spread on the doorposts of where they were living. And as the death angel would go through, um, they would see the blood or the angel would see the blood pass over and they would be spared. Obviously now we see that come to fruition uh, in its completed form with Christ having died on the cross and now each of us can have that same blood applied to our lives. Um, so again, Exodus 12, you have this finality of the children of Israel finally being told to go and God's justice you see is completed in the fact of all the years of hardship and toil and all that was lost is restored in that as they're leaving, uh, they're able to um, lead the land with so much more than what they came with. Exodus 13, 14, and 15, you have uh, so many pivotal things happening in these chapters. First off in chapter 13, you see the instructions that God gives for the Passover um, as, as the children uh, of God will follow um, these um, rituals that, that give honor and glory to God. Going forward, uh, these specific instructions are, are meant to be, it says, like a mark um, on their their hand or on their forehead. Um, you see, this this will be something that will come up time and time again um, in the future, but um, specifically, um, this understanding of the firstborn and sacrificing um, was to be remembered and how God spared them during um, this final plague of Egypt. Um, and they're off to always sacrifice uh, lambs in return. Um, they can spare the firstborn of the donkeys by sacrificing a lamb in its place, and as well as the children um, to specifically sacrifice on behalf of each firstborn child um, a lamb. And, and again, you're seeing this, um, this mark, this remembrance, um, this glory given to God. Chapter 14, uh, God's been leading the children out. Uh, the specific Israelites um, out and you have the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night that God is specifically himself going before them um, and, and gives instruction to, to go off um, the way that would not be the easy way per se um, along the coast near where the Philistines are, are at um, just because um, God's looking out for, for the people to say um, this is a path of least resistance in the amount of people that are, are, are facing you. And yet he still leads them up against the sea. And you see where when they come to a stop, um, Pharaoh has now um, 
again, woken up to where he's very frustrated and he's hardened um, against God and, and pursues the children of Israel. Um, in a sense, they're trapped um, between the sea and, and Pharaoh uh, pursuing from Egypt. <clears throat> and God has now moved from leading them to now protecting them. Um, so God, this um, cloud and, and pillar uh, moves uh, now behind uh, this is a pillar of fire that literally is protecting the children of Israel as the approaching armies come upon them. Um, God speaks to Moses, tells him to, to raise his staff and part these waters um, that they would pass through on dry ground. And this pillar of fire protects um, them throughout this entire process as they cross over. And then at some point, um, once they're well across, uh, the pillar moves then, and Pharaoh's armies are able to proceed into the um, same path. And once the children of Israel reach the other side, um, very famously, we know the story of um, staff being lowered and the waters enclosing, um, enclosing in on all of Pharaoh's armies. And the um, confusion of, of the chariots and the horses and um, literally the, the wheels coming off as the water comes um, in together. And now what's very horrible for the uh, Egyptians is absolute victory and freedom um, safety, salvation for the Israel, um, the children of Israel. And so going forward, you see excitement, you see joy. Um, chapter 15 is what's known as the Song of Moses. A uh, pastor recently preached a great sermon on that that I will link here. And then you, as well, you see Miriam, you have the, the women, of course, Miriam's uh, Moses's older sister that you originally saw way back uh, watching him in, in the river um, when Pharaoh's daughter first found Moses. Um, and you have Miriam with the other ladies um, singing and, and praising the Lord with the tab tambourine um, as the specific song of Moses is detailed at length, um, makes up um, the majority of chapter 15. And so all this goes forth. Again, this is a pivotal story of Israel's salvation as we go forward. It's a picture not only for them, but for all the surrounding areas um, to know the glory of God, to know that God is set apart from any of the other gods of that culture, that he is far above anyone and anything else. Exodus 16, uh, you see the children of Israel uh, move from what is a uh, kind of an oasis place, uh, Elam, uh, over by the coastal area into the desert of um, Sin. And there you have a lot of complaints that arise immediately, um, saying that at least in Egypt they had um, provision, that there was um, just the basic needs that were met, even though all they, all they knew was constant toil and work. Um, here you have in this chapter uh, manna in introduced, which uh, that's only named just because you know they don't they don't know what it is. It's this um, kind of very puzzling um, frost-like uh, bread that that flaky bread that falls from the sky and, and is is there in the morning for them to eat. They're specifically told to only gather what's there for, for that day. On the sixth day, there's enough for the two days. Was considering that the seventh day, nothing is is there. Um, and if they do try to keep it in a typical day, not, not the sixth day, but normal days, the, uh, it becomes wormy and, and, and uh, uh, disgusting the following morning. But typically it's sweet, it's pleasant. Um, so God provides uh, for his people when they need it. Uh, in chapter 17, there's water that comes from a rock. God specifically gives uh, Moses instruction on striking the rock and um, the, the leaders of Israel see uh, this happen and uh, again God's brought glory you see in the end of chapter 17 the uh, first real strong mention of uh, Amalek and the uh, Amalekites that come at and attack the children of Israel um, you have the uh, story of Moses holding his hands up in the battle um, that Joshua leads um, goes well as long as he's holding his hands up and Aaron and her have to come and assist Moses to, to keep these ha his hands held up until sunset. Um, and of course, there's victory that's won um, over this these ferocious soldiers that, that come after them. And then in chapter 18, 
Jethro, of course, Moses' father-in-law, comes and finds out all that has happened um, in these uh, chapters. Uh, he, he comes from Midian, uh, brings Moses' family, who's been with him in this time, and helps Moses with the art of delegation. Previously, Moses has been hearing every manner, uh, every matter specifically himself. Um, people are waiting in line for um, hours and hours all through the day um, for their, their disputes and, and quarrels to be heard. Um, Jeff, Jethro's advice, of course, remember he was the priest of Midian, so he has lots of uh, experience with leadership, um, is to set up um, segments, um, kind of uh, levels of, of demarcation and um, specific uh, amounts of people that you have kind of the system of governance set up. And Moses was still here, uh, all the major quarrels, but then there'd be other leaders that could take up some of the um, smaller matters. There's not a specific uh, distinction made between um, types of disputes. Um, of course, all life kind of has this um, overlap between um, areas that would fall into a spiritual versus um, just natural category. And so you have uh, the leaders that are able to take responsibility then in determining what actually has to be brought to Moses um, versus what is not. Um, so some interesting things that are in these chapters. Um, you also have the, the note of manna that is uh, told to be stored up. It's told to be placed by the covenant. And uh, you don't have that actually specifically marked down yet in the sense of the Ark of the Covenant. It's not made yet, and, and neither have the tablets been given. We'll, we'll see that very soon. Um, but yet we still see kind of um, these pictures. I, I believe that, that in chapter 16 especially, you have all of what encompasses manna being talked about in just that chapter since it's um, organized kind of with an easier way to get your thoughts around it. So a little telegraph to the 40 years in the wilderness and, and things of that nature that maybe we don't see that 100% chronologically laid out, um, but as we're going through um, this understanding of what manna is established and um, those kind of things are, are, are lumped together in ways that they're um, straightforward for the narrative. So bless you all today. I hope you all have a fantastic Tuesday. And, uh